to what I believe is the seventh in our series of Education 2020 uh, live audience events, uh, subsequently uh, recorded and available for posterity on both the uh, Hoover and Fordham Institute websites. Uh, we're delighted that you're here on this gorgeous uh, early spring day. I'm Chuck Finn with the Fordham Institute, uh, and uh, we have, a, I think, a treat in store for you this afternoon. Uh, we have two fantastic uh, speakers, in spite of the fact that each of their names starts with the word professor. Uh, they are uh, I, 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 interesting, lucid, and, uh, and, and, and insightful. Uh, Bill Damon, uh, who is a colleague of, of, of mine at Hoover, is mostly a professor uh, at Stanford and is director of Stanford Center on Adolescence. You can see his biography on the, on the handout that you received on the way in. Uh, he has been pursuing for a long time now uh, questions of uh, what motivates kids to learn, of purpose in life, of the need for purpose uh, in people's lives, of the challenges of the education system in producing such a thing, uh, and uh, as well as the education of citizens, uh, which is uh, one of uh, his most provocative books. And I think, as I said, you're in for a treat this afternoon. After, after Bill talks for 20 or so minutes, I will come back up uh, with some questions of my own, and then we will open the conversation. Uh, at about 5 o'clock, we will take a brief stretch break, uh, after which uh, uh, Mike Petrilli will come up and introduce uh, Professor Robbie George. So without further ado, Bill Damon, take it away, and thank you very much. Thank you, Checker. So as, uh, as Checker said, I'm going to talk about purpose, and my overall message is very simple, which is that schools need to be places where purposeful learning takes place. Uh, if, uh, if a student is a purposeful learner, the student is likely to learn. And students that aren't purposeful, they may learn something, but whether they will retain it, how deep they will go in it, whether or not uh, they will ever get back to it again is questionable. I'll say a couple words about purpose. Uh, I'm partial to purpose because, as Checker said, our group at Stanford, my center, has focused on the concept of purpose and how it develops over the last 20 years or so. And let me just say a little bit about what purpose is and why it's important. Purpose is a goal. It's not just any kind of a goal. It's a, it's a special goal. It's long term. Uh, it, uh, it isn't simply, you don't have a purpose for finding a parking place in town or even something noble or heroic like jumping in the river to save somebody who's drowning. Uh, that's not what you would call a purpose. A purpose is a commitment. It's a commitment to accomplish something. And purpose is meaningful. Uh, it's something that you believe in. Uh, there are lots of things you do in life that you don't necessarily believe in or, or you don't own that are important. Um, you need to obey traffic laws. You need to, uh, students should do their homework even if they don't necessarily invest themselves in it. That's not necessarily purpose. C purpose is not by command. It's something that you bring yourself to voluntarily and you own it. And it's something of consequence. It's a, an attempt to accomplish something. And something that's not all about me. It's something of consequence to the world. Uh, Rick Warren's book, A Purpose-Driven Purpose -driven, uh, Life, uh, starts with the sentence, it's not all about you. It's, it's something bigger than that. And uh, the reason I will always take a little time to define purpose it is because it's because of the special features of purpose, which no other concept shares, because every concept has its own meaning. Uh, because of its special features, it brings special benefits to people. Um, purpose um, has been related in lots of studies all through the lifespan to achievement, energy, resilience, health. Gerontology has been transformed by studies that purpose is important. Uh, it's inversely related to morbidity and mortality and lots of health benefits. Uh, sub uh, emotional stability, well-being. Uh, it's not a silver bullet, and uh, it, there are lots of other things that are important in life, too, and I always, uh, I always um, want to make that claim, uh, want to make that statement because I'm not claiming I have a, 
uh, a magic elixir that we're, uh, that we're offering that cures all of life's problems. But it is a very important motivator in life, and it deters uh, qualities like self-absorption and, uh, and other, other, um, uh, other detrimental qualities in life. Schools, um, uh, are places that ought to be places where students find purpose. And there are a number of different kinds of purpose that are important in life. Some of them are central to the mission of schools. Some aren't. Uh, there are purposes of faith, for example, and certainly public schooling. Um, I, I don't think you'd want to say uh, is a place that um, would uh, educate for a particular kind of faith. Family purpose is another purpose that maybe uh, elsewhere uh, uh, young people find opportunities to develop. But there are three kinds of purpose that are absolutely central to the mission of schooling. And that's what I'm going to focus <laughs> on here. One is academic purpose and related to that vocational purpose. Obviously, schools are places that prepare students for learning and for vocations. Another is what's been called character or education or moral education. And uh, there's been a lot of controversy about this, but it's unnecessary because school is a place where students do a lot of living. And uh, lots of moral and character issues come up naturally in schooling. Uh, as Irving Crispell used to say frequently, it goes with the territory of education. Uh, everything from academic integrity, honesty, uh, relations with ethical relations with peers, respect for authority, all of these moral and character issues are everyday issues in school. And schools that don't get those right are disorderly and don't even do the education right. And the third um, type of purpose that's, uh, that schools in a democracy <laughs> are responsible for is civic purpose, citizenship education. And that's what I'm going to uh, focus on. And I start with uh, the vocational and academic side of things. And I am, um, in this area, this is not my area of expertise, but I have done a lot of observations in schools where I have gone to visit and talk. And I can say that from and let me, let me begin by saying it is not an educational wasteland out there. There's, there are, I've seen lots of schools that do this right, that are, that are great places to learn, where students are thrilled about what they're hearing and so on. That's the good news, and I, I don't want to overstate the bad news. The bad news is that there are vast numbers of schools where students are finding nothing that they can invest themselves in. And in the paper that I've written for this uh, uh, um, enterprise, uh, I uh, complain a lot about the effects of the federal programs that have taken place in recent years, especially Race to the Top, where when I have visited schools, that's where I have really heard teachers complain about the, about exactly things that are antithetical to the development of purpose in young people. And I'll just quickly mention these, uh, and I'll be glad to go on to develop this further in the, um, in the question sec session. But one of, one of the problems uh, has been a, a the race to the top has created a, a number of incentives that, uh, that have encouraged superintendents, principals, and put pressure on teachers to focus on a narrow selection of skills and, uh, and knowledge. And I want to say from the beginning, I'm, I'm not against at all uh, high standards, basic skills. I'm actually in favor of testing and assessment. So all of that is important, but not to the exclusion. You can, you can walk and chew gum at the same time and not to the exclusion of what's been 
considered in lots of districts that I visited peripheral and not what the schools themselves are being judged on and what the incentives are driving them to do. And among those peripheral subjects are subjects like art, music. I've, I've been in school systems where they say they've had to stop funding the music teacher who comes around because they've had to invest their efforts or their attention or their resources in the, basic, the kinds of basic skills that they ultimately will be assessed on. I um, always hesitate, I always uh, uh, say very quickly that I understand that the uh, motivation behind this is a vocational one because of the importance of the STEM and the basic uh, skills agendas for employment. But it's also important to realize, and this is a very narrow view, and there are two points I'd make. One is that many students find their interest, find their purpose in exactly the, these peripheral subjects like art, music, theater, which actually are a big part of our economy. I've heard from economists that um, the, the media industry and the entertainment industry is the third largest GDP uh, in, uh, source in this country. And it's one of the largest exports uh, industries. So these are valid industries that students uh, who would find their purpose in those areas are not having an opportunity to do because of the narrowing of the curriculum uh, driven by the incentives of what's being tested. Uh, and the other problem, which I read about in the newspapers, is that the incentives were so strong during the Duncan period uh, that there was a temptation for a lot of educators to fudge scores, to misreport data, to cheat, actually. And what does that do? The children are watching. And what, does that, what kind of a message does that send to students when, uh, when they find out that their authority figures are actually cheating in order to gain incentives? Which brings me to moral and character education, which, as I said, is part and parcel of every school day. But even beyond that, uh, there are opportunities to, um, to raise larger moral and ethical issues in the classroom. And the resistance, and I know part of the theme of, uh, of Checker's uh, series here, uh, is questioning the influence of progressives on um, our choices that educators make. And in my, uh, this is, and this is an area I know, uh, that I have uh, spent years in moral and character education, and the resistance is always something that comes from the progressive agenda of paying attention to minority c cultural groups, uh, diversity, and so on, as if you could find cultural groups anywhere that don't care about issues like honesty uh, or respect. These are universal issues. Every, people, parents everywhere. In fact, there was a poll done once uh, in, in American schools that 98% of parents wanted their children to be, to be raised as, to tell the truth, to be honest. You don't have to wonder about the other 2%, but 98% is a pretty <laughs> strong um, source. And so the hesitancy to actually bring out in classrooms in an explicit way moral and character issues, issues of common decency, issues of uh, compassion and, and, and the character, the kinds of character strengths of fair-mindedness and future-mindedness and grit. I mean, all of these are, uh, are of interest to the young people. And, uh, and schools that are doing this, and there are, as I said at the beginning, I've been to lots of schools that are doing this and doing this well. And the problem is that m many schools, or maybe most schools, aren't. And the resistance is coming from this sense that who are we to tell other people from other groups uh, what to believe? Uh, it's, it's foolish and misdirected. The, um, the other point that I, w uh, that I really want to um, get, in the, the limited, get to in the limited time I have is on the third type of, uh, or the third kind of purpose that I think is absolutely essential 
as the, um, uh, for the mission of American schooling, and that's citizenship education. And I'll just um, note a couple of statistics here. During the, um, during the period that, uh, of, the, of the last um, of this regime where citizenship itself and civics itself uh, has taken a back seat and, hit, and the closely related subject of history, um, the uh, tests that have been done in citizenship, uh, the National Assessment of Student Progress found that only one in four high school seniors scored at least proficient in knowledge of U.S. citizenship, one in four. For fourth and eighth graders, of all academic subjects tested, civics and the closely linked subject of history came in last. Quote, a smaller proportion de demonstrated proficiency in civics than in any other subject the federal government has tested. This is a problem for our democracy. Uh, since this report came out, there, there have been, <coughs> this, did re this did bring some attention to this, and some high profile figures such as Sandra Day O'Connor called this a crisis, uh, and some states, including my own, California, Florida, Texas, have had commissions and have done something about this. So um, uh, there's been a, a bit of a movement of the pendulum back and some attention, but other, but many key concepts have, are still not addressed. There has not been the kind of attention uh, to how to get this subject matter across that it needs, and lots of places, again, haven't, haven't gotten to this as a, a main, as, a, as a main agenda. Now, I want to say what the purpose angle is on this. The, this is all about civic knowledge and the lack of uh, proficiency, but as I said at the very beginning, if you want students to learn something, you want them to be motivated. You want them to care about it. You want them to be purposeful. And uh, in civics, as in all other uh, areas, there has been a failure in a, in a lot of schools, in maybe most schools, to approach the subject in the way that would make students care about it, to be purposeful. Uh, and there is a motivation towards citizenship that goes back as far as the ancient Greeks, who coined the term patriotism. Patriotism is the love of one's society. It's caring about one's civic society. And it is not a popular word in educational circles. In fact, try it out as an, <laughs> I, I invite you to try this, as a, to replicate this experiment of trying to talk about patriotism around teachers or administrators. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's a non-starter. Because educators confuse patriotism with a kind of a militaristic chauvinism that 20th century dictators used to start wars and manipulate masses. And uh, there's very little awareness, strangely, uh, because educators ought to be well educated themselves, but what doesn't seem to occur to people is that it was the patriotic resistance to dictatorships by citizens of democracies such as ours that saved the world from tyranny in the 20th century. Patriotism in the, in the service of, of democracy, in the service of, in this case, uh, in our society, in, in the case of the American tradition. Uh, so patriotism is a form of allegiance that can serve the best of our tradition. And it's exactly what students need in order to, in order to, to have, be motivated enough to learn and to engage in civic society. But let me just read you a couple of quick quotes to show you what kind of we're up against. Um, these are a couple of quotes from uh, educators. Uh, this is not a form of allegiance that people need. Quote, patriotism motivates more death than justice. Patriotism, another quote, propagates the myth that America stands for the rule of law and stands for democracy. Quote, it's not innocent. It's reproducing institutions which possess vast armaments. Another quote, an education that takes national boundaries is morally salient 
reinforces irrationality by ending to what by lending to what is an accident of history a false air of moral weight and glory and then finally this nationalistic view is abhorrent so there's a lot of passion against patriotism uh, uh, and um, and related to that the whole idea of helping students or encouraging students to identify as Americans who care about our society. And I'll read you one more quote, the last quote I'm going to read. Uh, you almost c couldn't make this stuff up, this one, but from a professor. Longstanding notions of democratic citizenship are becoming obsolete even as we cling to them. American identity is unsustainable in the face of globalization. Loyalties are moving in transnational communities defined in many different ways by race, ethnicity, gender, religion, age, and sexual orientation. So this is the view of essentially a society made up of separate groups that don't have anything in common and certainly not a sense of American identity and some kind of global uh, citizenship. Uh, but as for global citizenship, I will point out there's nothing to teach students. We don't pay taxes to the world. We don't serve on world juries. We don't vote for a world president or senators. We don't serve in a world army or peace corps. We're not called to jury duty in the world. In other words, all the things that students need to learn about civic obligation are national, are, are local, are things that have to do with the United States. And as for national, and I, this is the point that I, again, it's astonishing to me how little people know about history, educators, educate, educated, uh, educated, ed educated as ed educators. Um, I quote uh, Michael Walzer, philosopher, who said, I am not a citizen of the world. I'm not even aware that there's a world in which one could be a citizen of. Uh, referring to the kind of thing I'm mentioning, that the, the acts that you need to learn as citizenship and, and, and enact and engage are actually on the national level. And finally, uh, one more, uh, so one more uh, source of support I'll mention is Eleanor Roosevelt, who I think was hardly considered a chauvinistic uh, um, provincialist in her day. But when she did the very hard work, and I think noble work, of getting the um, Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights through the UN in 1948, she made a point of saying this needs to be implemented on a national level by nation states because there's no other way you can do it. There's no other, other place. And every place will do it in its own way, but these are universal principles. And as a moral and uh, social uh, initiative and educational, because she believed in, the edu in educating people, it, it needs to happen in nation states. So again, this idea of global citizenship or cosmopolitan citizenship is it's, it's a myth. It, 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 there's nothing there. There's no there there. And yet, that is the, that's the zeitgeist. That's the popular view in, through K th in K through 12 education to the extent that people deal in citizenship. It's not towards American, uh, Americanism or, or the great American tradition. Um, I'll end, actually, I'm going to end now, but I'm going to end, <laughs> I'm going to end with a, with a movie review. Uh, because um, uh, it's on my mind because I just saw this movie uh, last week and I thought, you know, I really need to say something about this. And I have a quote here that I want to, um, yeah, here it is, okay. So the movie I saw was First Man about the Apollo 11 um, landing on the moon. And I, uh, to date myself, I was actually old enough to actually watch this on a black and white, t watch this landing. Uh, when it happened back in 1969. I thought it was thrilling. And I saw this reenacted in, in the movie, and I, I kind of scratched my head because it didn't look right. I, there was something missing. And I thought about it afterwards, and I figured, you know what? They didn't plant the flag. <laughs> they took this out of the movie. And I thought, what is going on here? Uh, so I, I used my source of all information, which is Google, and I, I, I Googled, Googled stuff, and it turns out this was actually a controversy. I have no idea, there's no way of knowing what the filmmakers really had in mind. Certainly they did not have patriotism in mind or anything like that. Although this was a great American achievement. I even remember being in Europe later that summer and people loved Americans because we had gone on the moon. So um, 
uh, and, and, and this is an opportunity, and it's an opportunity for young people to feel proud of our country. Also, in feeling <coughs> pride in the country, it's a way to bring people together. Uh, and again, progressives are supposed to be against polarization and all of that. This is a way of unifying people. So I'm going to quote. Uh, so I, I looked around to see if anybody agreed with me, and I found one quote uh, of somebody that I, that I loved because I thought it really captured. And it's from Senator Marco Rubio. Uh, who said, and I quote, and this is my qu quote, it's a terrific quote, he said, first th the first thing he said is, this is total lunacy. <laughs> now, now I, d I don't know whether to give him credit for that, <laughs> for that double entendre, but it's great. It's <laughs> it, was, it was a great, and then he, but in, then he said, and, and this is the serious part, because it really gets to why I, one of the many reasons I care so much about the kind of civic purpose that patriotism is at the heart of. And he said, and it's a disservice at a time when our people need reminders of what we can achieve when we work together. And young people need that reminder. Thank you very much. Oh my, am I depressed. Uh, the, uh, if the educators don't want to do it, and then the kids go home and turn on the television, and they see, uh, instead of um, what, what you're calling patriotism, see kind of ugly nationalism and, 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 and selfish po politicians, um, where is the influence in their lives going to come from that is going to inculcate uh, anything resembling the kind of patriotism that you are correctly describing? Well, it's going to come from schools after we after we convince people that they're on the wrong track. I mean, this is, I, I, I think there is a, a, as I said, I, I did start by, and I, I intentionally started by saying there are actually a lot of good stories out there. Uh, and I'm not going to name names, probably because my memory is so bad, but, I've, uh, but I, I do a lot of speaking at schools and at school systems, charter schools and so on, and, uh, and, and public schools with, with some very good leaders. So. There are a lot of good cases, and it's a, it's a little bit, I think if, if we, if we folks in the room and you, Checker, uh, do a good job at getting these stories out, it's a little bit like in the old days, again, I'll date myself, I remember when there was an East and West Berlin, and you know, you kind of knew that, you sort of knew at the time, even when everybody was being pessimistic, that East Berlin couldn't exist very long as long as they could see West Berlin. That eventually that wall was going to come down. I, I always did believe that. So you've got a kind of optimism of inevitability here. Somehow these I, people are bound to see the light someday. The truth does have a way <laughs> of coming out, doesn't it? I mean, isn't that the story of history? Uh, I think that's the long view is probably right. Uh, I, I'm still depressed in the short run. <laughs> uh, and uh, likely, to, likely to stay that way for a while. But, but picking up on your, your, just your mention of charter schools, because I wanted to ask you this anyway. Yeah. yeah. Is, is, do we have... If we can't fix the m macro system of public education at a macro level, uh, are we d fated to rely on some form of school choice so that people can go to schools that do it right, that do it well? Well, OK, I, I think school choice is important for a lot of reasons. And I'm going to get back to pr purpose, because purpose is actually an individual phenomenon. Everybody, every individual has, finds their own purpose in some way or other. Uh, and uh, the glory of American education, I love this in higher education too, is its pluralism. It, there are a lot of different types of schools, a lot of different kinds of colleges, and the hope is that students will find their match. That's why I always tell students not to, college, uh, students applying to college not to, not to go crazy about trying to get into the most elite places. The, the most important thing is to get into the place that matches the students' own interests and ultimately purpose. And so charter schools, school choice, uh, increases the chances that will happen. And it also gives people opportunity to create models that, as I said, if we do, our good, if we do a good job getting the word out and, and also showing the results and so on, uh, I believe educators are going to eventually, everywhere, uh, the people of faith are going to are going to need to pay attention and follow the models. So to cheer myself up uh, and follow your your what you just said, 
here is actual real live example from an uh, experience I had uh, a few weeks ago. I, uh, circumstances are too complicated to explain, but I ended up having dinner with an 11th grade kid at a, a well-regarded private school. And I said to him, uh, to make it short, what do, you, what, what do you like to do? What excites you? What, do you, what, do you, what, what are you enthusiastic about here? Uh, and in short order, it turned out that three things turned on this kid. Physics, running, and singing. <laughs> Physics, running, and singing. And he was good at all three of them. Uh, he, was, uh, he was doing advanced singing. He was on the school's cross-country team and making very good times uh, on, on these courses. And he was doing a cappella and in a choir that was about to go someplace to, 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 to give a concert. Uh, so this was a kid who had, I think, probably found his purpose at the school, actually. Yeah. Uh, I'm not certain whether he arrived up. He probably liked running before he got there. Um, but he probably hadn't had maybe singing. I bet he hadn't had any experience with physics um, uh, right. before he got there. So this was, but this was a private school that is selective. And they may be able to select applicants on the basis of whether they look like they've got a sense of purpose or a gleam in their eye or a, or, or a desire to find some purpose. I don't know that. Um, react. Well, well uh, first of all, purpose is a fairly late developing capacity. So for most people, it, it really doesn't develop until school or until college or even later. Uh, so, there's, so the school doesn't need to select students that already have purpose. It's part of the school's job to create opportunities that the student will find purpose. And uh, I think, uh, I understand that, that this is a selective school, but we, uh, we have national surveys in our data set. And I can tell you that students from every community, and even students that are very poorly educated, are finding purpose in, in other places. So. Uh, is the school uh, co helping them do that? Or are they doing it on their own? I mean, what's uh, the what's uh, the dynamic by which a school helps a kid to find a purpose? It's the same dynamic as as anywhere. Uh, first of all, uh, there has to be some match with uh, an interest that's, that the student has, something the student's interested in. Every student has some spark, or maybe many sparks. In the, in your case, several. And is the school offering opportunities that, that the student can pursue that? Is the, student, is the school providing models of purpose? Uh, all of the young people that we've studied that are really purposeful have seen some instantiation of that in somebody else, in some adult mm -hmm. who is living a life of purpose. So is the school providing any kind of mentoring? Is the school uh, giving enough information about the world so that the student sees something out there that can be improved? Because that's part of what purpose is about, is trying to accomplish something. And it can be something n noble in curing cancer, or it can be something, uh, uh, some vocation, uh, or it could be something musical, or it could be something vocational uh, on, on any level. Uh, trade, uh, I, I like to, uh, I want to be a house painter to make beautiful, you know. Uh, but something, is the school giving, uh, uh, providing the student with enough information about the world? So the student has some sense of how my interests can match something I can become good at doing that can in some way contribute something uh, that is needed in the world. So this sort of resonates with the literature on school effectiveness. I mean, what makes an effective school is when you start reading into that research or going around and visiting them like, like you've been doing and I've done some, uh, you invariably find out that a great school is one with a purpose, with a mission, with a coherence, with a mm -hmm. culture, uh, with a leadership, with a team that is sort of uh, rowing in the same direction, stuff like that. Uh, and I, and I, I see how that works in isolated schools, um, district schools, charter schools, private schools. I don't see how this works at scale or how it can be made to work at scale. I should add, I've just, like last week, finished a four-year term on the Maryland State Board of Education, and that included uh, all sorts of state policy stuff, and including looking at the state's social studies standards, uh, by which it expects all the kids in this whole state to learn these things in social studies, under which we would normally put civics and so on. Mm -hmm. It's also one of the many states that has a, a graduation requirement. You have to take a civics course in high school, or you can't get a diploma. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, not only were these standards kind of abysmal, uh, the sort of thing that the National uh, Council of Social Studies dictates around the country, 
uh, which is very thin on content and very weak in general. But also, um, I didn't see how a state can cause this to happen, yeah. even if it had good standards. Yeah. Well, you're, you're right, Checker. Uh, I think the standards are helpful. Uh, it, it, this is, it's not either or. I think, I think it's, it's helpful to have standards out there and some kind of a, a state or even national mandate in some sense that these are, these are the kinds of things that students should learn. And that's why I think core kinds of efforts are, are useful. But you're absolutely right. That cannot do the job. You have to create a school climate where there's, it's, it's the teacher-child interaction that, that is all important. And you have to create, um, you have to create a uh, set of conditions where the students find out why this is important. Uh, and, and there isn't any centralized uh, bureaucratic solution to that. Which, which is the same as saying it cannot be done at scale in a... In a it, cannot be, it cannot be completely done at scale. What can be done at scale is to send certain messages out, to, to give s examples or types of information that should be mastered, mm -hmm. skills, and so on. But the teaching cannot be done at scale. And you, if, you, if, you, if you wrote out of what you thought were the perfect curriculum and had every teacher recite it or something like that, it would be an, an abysmal failure. You have to, you have to create. First of all, you have to, personalization is important. The teacher needs enough space and time to pay attention to every individual child's mm -hmm. uh, interest. So, individualization, personalization needs to happen in addition to some things that should exist at scale. So, let's slightly switch the They're subject and get yeah. into the fad du jour of American education for the last at least few years and for the next few is called social and emotional learning, also known as SEL. Yep. It's got... Um, I've heard of it. You've heard of it. It's got massive foundation yeah. support, national commissions, uh, uh, big reports, uh, lots of enthusiasm. Some of us actually think, think that it's kind of a diversion from reading and math, actually, right. Um, right. rather than a supplement to it. But, yep. but, but relate, if you can, social-emotional learning as it is taking hold with character education and yeah. purpose and, and even patriotism. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't need to be too original on this. There was, a, there was a very important book about this written about 20 years ago by uh, uh, James Hunter, um, who uh, entitled the book The Death of Character. Which the Death of Character, yes. He's the guy at UVA, James Davison Hunter, right? Yes, James, yeah. he's, okay. a, he's a professor at University of Virginia. And I, I, I never liked the title because um, I actually re reviewed the book, and I thought it was a very important book and basically right. I don't think you can kill character. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give schools that much, or SEL, that much power. <laughs> uh, you, you, you can't kill it. Uh, there will always be people of character, no matter what you s subject them to. But he was absolutely right in one sense, which is that a lot of SEL is based on a, a kind of amoral, um, kind of uh, social uh, being nice or social skills, and and if you take the if you take the moral messages out of it, uh, you actually can do m more harm than good. Um, sc people need to, uh, schools and parents and adults need to take a position on these things, uh, on what's right and what's wrong. You know, Plato, this goes way back, I, I'm not being original at all. Uh, Plato said the first duty of every adult is to help children find pleasure in the right things, which is basically what I'm saying. It's motivation. You want them to be motivated to do the right thing. And that means you need to know what's right and what's wrong, and it's not that hard. Uh, well, the, when you look at the literature on social-emotional learning, at least from the advocacy groups that are promoting it, uh, you don't find talk like what you just well, said. Well, that's what I'm saying, yes. so I have a problem with that. No, no, I think it's... Uh, and yet, uh, yeah. and yet, one of the things that comes through yeah. loud and clear in both in your paper and in your critique of, of let's say, uh, uh, Race to the Top and No Child Left Behind and so forth, is that it, with this narrow focus on, on uh, cognitive skills, We've lost sight of the uh, many people say the whole child, right. Right. Uh, and the SEL people, I think, to their credit, are are trying like so many yeah. movements before them to bring the whole child back into view. I think that's right, and I mean the irony. Uh, th th these, this is replete with ironies because 
the whole idea, the whole idea of whole child was always a progressive idea, but it's the pro it, a lot of the progressive programs have actually been uh, diminishing schools' ability to do this. And with the SEL, I, th I think that's right. I think it is important that social and moral issues, the teachers spend time on, on that. E and, and even though you say it's a, it's a digression from reading and so on, but, but uh, the s students that, uh, well, uh, I, I didn't get it. It's an excuse for not necessarily yeah. doing very well at yeah. reading and math in your school because we've got a family-like right. atmosphere. I've I, heard a prize-winning principal more or less say that about her school. In essence, she said, well, they don't learn very much, but we have a family-like atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so, my, uh, so my, uh, my conclusion about SEL is it's imp it is important to get into these areas, but it's important to do it in a way that has, that's not relative, that has, n that has a moral backbone to it uh, and isn't just anything goes. Uh, and and I, I will say one other thing about, uh, about schools is that schools are also concerned with the well-being of students. With the, that's part of the whole child. And I had another part that I didn't quite have time to read, but if you give me one more second and I can dig this out of here. We're um, going to get the audience in just a minute, too, yeah, so you all but, get ready. But this is, this is uh, if you really want to get depressed, um, this is I the, started that way. Come yeah, on. Yeah, okay. But, uh, but I will say, uh, let's see if I can quickly find this. Uh, um, it's basically, uh, oh yeah, here it is. Um, so what's happened to the cohort that grew up under Race to the Top now that they're in college? And this is about well-being. Mm -hmm. uh, 2017, that's, le that's no, I'm sorry, two years ago, assessment by the American College Health Association reported that this crop of college students, quote, over 80% felt overwhelmed by all they had to do and exhausted by their academic workload. Three in five felt overwhelming anxiety in college Two in five felt so depressed that it was difficult to function, and over half reported feeling hopeless, which is really a serious issue. I mean, if you know mental health, that's something to, that's something that, to raise all kinds so of you're, you're not going to let me get away with just saying spoiled brats, are you? Yeah, right. And, 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 and by the way, you, you, you really can't blame this, knowing the, co the current college, what's going on in college with grade inflation. You cannot blame this on, on colleges having rigorously high, excruciatingly high standards. This is not the fault. The, uh, and there may be other reasons in the society that this cohort is having difficulty, but at the very least, you can say the schools during the Race to the Top era were not helping students to develop the character strength that would help them avoid these kinds of problems. And so I say, yes, schools do need to take on these social and personal issues, but they need to do it in a way that is that is morally um, legitimate. So last question, I think, for, I think for me, we're sitting here at the Hoover Institution. Uh, so what is it, why, a, a, a self-respecting conservative might well say, why do schools have to worry about people's moral development and character formation? Uh, why isn't this the job of home and church yeah. and civil society and, uh, and neighborhood and all of the other forces at work in a child's life? Why does everything get dumped on the schools as their job? Well, because uh, I will say we conservatives also are known to be realists. <laughs> and yes. And maybe that's enough said, but uh, you know, because because this is <laughs> this is the only shot that a lot of students will have at getting this, unfortunately, or or whatever. And, I mean, this is the place that uh, this is the place that we actually could, and and in many cases do this job, and uh, it's important. It's important for the individual students, and it's important for our country. You know, much as I agree with that, I'm also mindful of our, this society's tendency to assign all responsibilities to schools that nobody else is taking care of. I mean, drug yeah. education, sex education, uh, um, the, the um, Mike Petrilli, who's uh, about to be up here, uh, has a fifth grader who's getting sex education in a public school in the community where they live because that's part of the fifth grade curriculum. Uh, it's, uh, is, is, is that, I mean, well, I don't want to mean to get into sex yeah. education. I just mean to use yeah, it right. as an example <laughs> of our tendency to say schools have yeah. to do everything, uh, yeah. and, and yet they don't have that, ha that yeah. large a purchase on the lives of people. You're, you're right, Checker, and I, I'm, glad, I'm really glad you're saying that because I also believe in 
and conservatives also believe that there are limits, and there have to be limits to what schools can take on. And that's kind of why I started by, at the be begin, remember at the beginning I said, um, there are three things I think that are essential and core. Vocational, academic is one, mm -hmm. moral and character is another, and citizenship is another. And there's a host of other issues that are family, faith, and so on. I, I might put even put sex education in that other, in that other category. But the, yes, there are limits, and thank you for saying that. Schools can't be everything. Okay, folks, it's your turn. Um, we've got some veteran educators in the crowd, too, a few of whom I recognize. You, you uh, could, at sight. I think I'm going to start with one, Susan Sclafani. Uh, but who, whomever you are, if I, since I don't know most people's names, identify yourself. If you could take the mic, Susan. Yes, make sure it's on. We're being recorded for posterity. Your talk. I, um, I just came from a board meeting of character.org, the former oh, character yeah. education sure. partnership. So if people want to be less depressed, go to the website, yeah. and there are hundreds of schools that have adopted exactly. character education and, of course, have seen, just as you said, that grades go up, discipline go, problems go down. The whole school becomes the supportive community for kids who who may not find that kind of support yeah. outside of school. So it, it is happening and it's getting more popular. And I think that uh, as schools look around for solutions, they recognize that SEL makes a great mantra, but it doesn't tell them how to do it. And character.org uh, has 11 principles yes. and it helps people to understand how to implement them. Yes, thank you. I, I've worked a lot with character. Don't, don't take the mic away from her yet, because I'm yeah. going to push her on something. Yeah. All right. but, uh, but let but me just say, I want to say thank you. I've worked a lot with those folks. Uh, as I said, nothing I really said today was original. And so in the, the Tom Lacona's 11 principles, right. I'm on board with, all of that. So thank you. Yes. I so when you say that a school has adopted character as part of what it does, uh, mm -hmm. the, is this of the, 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 the centimeter deep uh, variety uh, like the schools I've walked into, which have you know the virtue of the month posted on yeah. the wall, and that's the extent of character education. Well, the point of character.org is to certify that, in fact, the school is, is really doing it. And so we okay. have not only applications from schools at the state level that then come forward if they are so they get to vetted. the national they level. They get vetted. They get vetted through the analysis of their application, but also through site visits to okay. make sure it's not <coughs> just a paper trail of uh, what they say they they're doing, okay. but that they're actually doing so it. So it's really in a kind of an accreditation it's system. It's an accreditation system. Okay, good, because I'm really down on the, the, the virtue of the Me month approach. Me too. Right, absolutely. Me too. So we all agree. I agree. All right, in August. I'm, or I'm just, all right, yeah. sorry, in the back. We'll come back here. Yes, good lady afternoon. in the back. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your statements. I especially liked when you spoke to scale. I wanted to know... Are who, we are you, who are you? My name is Maka Taylor, and I am the founder of Global Gains Consulting, local to Washington, D.C. I do hail from St. Louis, Missouri, though, by way of Ferguson, Missouri. Um, I wanted to ask, are we familiar with the deliberate dumbing down of America and Charlotte Iserbit? I, I, I'm not familiar with that, no. Well, that is a document. Um, in my advocacy, I, I work both practitioner and I consider it practitioner as a parent. Um, but I found that document very interesting. It kind of spoke to the core skills and all of the testing that's kind of happening. It also spoke to uh, potential implicit complicity within the Department of Education in creating wherever we are. And so as a parent, I just like to bring awareness to that document and also s to say that as a parent, there is a sort of juxtaposition that has to be navigated in teaching children, especially young in 2019, coming from a 1970s era and preparing them for beyond. There is definitely some room for improvement and vulnerability, I think, on all ends of education in dismantling various silos and um, acquiescing to a whole person, whole environment education. Are you in involving this into a question? I did follow it into a question. You weren't familiar with what I asked, so I couldn't follow up familiar with Familiar with Charlotte Iserbitt's work. Yes. I actually am from very long ago. I'm going to sit down. Thank you. Thanks thank you, very thank much. You. Thank you for telling us about that. Thank you. You were up, I think, next. Okay, bring the mic back to him. Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, Barry Stern. Um, 
I'm a graduate of SUSE. Your comments about the oh, Apollo reminded me of my experience with Apollo 13. I was down in Chile doing my dissertation research on political socialization, the first and only study of that in the country at the time. I was front page news in the, uh, before Allende got elected, <laughs> but <laughs> could write a book about that. But in any event, um, uh, Apollo 13, if people remember from the movie with Tom Hanks, a bunch of our astronauts oh, were trying to get oh, home, right. and they were, they were not. I had people, I was getting on the bus, people came up, are you American? Yes. We hope your astronauts get home. The very next question was, Como explica usted el éxito tecnológico de los Estados Unidos? How do you explain the technological success of the country? Happened to me about four times on my way home. I was, I was this tall guy with a crazy sweater and big, big, big feet. Um, and I thought about that, and I thought I gave a pretty good answer. Uh, and I think it came from all the education I got at Stanford. Alex Inkelis, you remember him from yeah, the Hoover Institution, sure, Chris, was on my committee. Oh, so uh, it, was, it was a wonderful, oh, that's a wonderful on, experience. Tough where, is anyway, this where is this going? So, so my, 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 my question is, and getting back to the, the, uh, the uh, yeah. checker's point, how do you scale this? Uh, and I'm going to provide a polemic here, and maybe you can respond to it. Yeah. In my opinion, we will never scale this thing of character development until we get rid of the factory model design of our high schools. Uh, the human brain, I learned this after Stanford, has 10 times more neurons per micron in the limbic brain, the lower brain, than it does in the cerebral cortex. And most of our decisions are made on the basis of that limbic brain. The, you couldn't ask, you couldn't come up with a worse design for adolescence than changing what you do every 45 to 50 minutes or 90 minutes in response to a bell in totally uncoordinated disciplinary silos where the teachers have no idea about the students they're mutually teaching. I taught high school. I got character development going. I used Vietnam War games to teach race relations at Berkeley High School yeah. between my coursework and my dissertation. So I know it can be done, yeah. but as, in my opinion, you're not going to get there yeah. with a factory model. You're going to have to use something like the English call the house system. So, we got Well, um, First of all, let me say I'm not a I'm not a big educational policy person. So I, I don't have all the answers. I like what I like what you said about the idea. It sounded a, little, a bit like projects and interdisciplinary, and these are good models and good ideas. I honestly don't know uh, how you get everybody to do anything. So I, the, the scale thing is is a difficult question. Other than providing good examples, providing news of results, getting people. I, I assume people want to do the right thing, so. If you know, once you invent penicillin, then you know the people are going to want to use it rather than leeches or something like that. So that that that's my model. I'm not a policy person. I will say one other thing about Apollo movies, though. Now that you mentioned it, which is that I really hope if if anybody makes a movie of the whatever the mission was that Alan Shepard went up on, they don't leave out the 200-yard six-iron golf shot. <laughs> that that would be <laughs> even worse than, <laughs> than leaving out the American flag. It helps to have limited gravity, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Mike. Yes, so Mike Petrilli, mostly famous for having a fifth grader who is doing sex ed in public school. Uh, he would be <laughs> horrified uh, to know this. I don't think he's watching. Uh, but also at Fordham <laughs> and at Hoover. So I would love, Bill, just g give yeah. me and other parents advice yeah. and our teachers advice that when it comes to this idea of, of developing a patriotic attachment yeah. uh, to our country. You, well, get specific. Yeah, th thank you for that. It's so, it, I think it's so much easier done than, than people believe. Uh, because especially with, uh, I mean, every society values patriotism. But, you know, we live in the United States. And there's actually a lot of things to be proud of, no matter, no matter who you are. Uh, and if you, if, if you let people, young people, know about some of the great achievements uh, that, uh, that we've done uh, on on every level, not to, uh, techno technological certainly, but moral. Uh, teach them about the, uh, teach them in a positive way about the civil rights movement, for example. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed that somebody told me recently that um, students are not learning about Martin Luther King Jr. anymore because of lots of reasons, but partly because uh, you know, it, it, the problems are still out there. They're not, they're not all corrected. Well, I can tell you that if, uh, it's important to be, you know, to all aspire to do better and be critical and all of that, but you need to start with the positive. Start with what was accomplished. That's how you, you get young people to invest and get off the dime. 
And there are so many stories uh, of, in our society of, of, of groups, liberation of groups coming in, <laughs> women's uh, suffering, you know, getting the vote, uh, uh, all of the things that we did. I mean, my, uh, I'm sorry to go on about this, but it's so frustrating to me. My two youngest uh, daughter, I have three kids, my two youngest ones were subjected in, in their history classrooms to Howard Zinn's book. Oh, uh, lucky, lucky uh, yeah. them. But it turns out, and I, I don't know if you've, it turns out, astonishingly enough, uh, he's critical of, uh, we did everything wrong in World War II, because I can't even remember the reasons, but you know, when we're out there uh, in well, uh, fighting we, should, for we shouldn't have won. Uh, I mean, I, it's amazing how you can find fault with, with almost anything. And uh, it is important, critical thinking is important, but I'm speaking as a developmental psychologist here. There are two things about critical thinking that, that educators should know. One is that you can't do critical thinking very well un until you have some sympathetic understanding of what it is you're criticizing. Uh, that's that's how you do the intelligent kind of critical thinking that makes that's constructive and makes things better. And the second thing is that in American society, uh, to talk about critici criticizing America, that's some, you could actually teach that as a virtue of our society. That's something you get to do in this country. It's not so easy in China. Uh, to, uh, this is a this, being critical of our society. Go, go for it. It's it's fine, but. That's a feature to be proud of, of, America, of the American tradition, as are lots of other things. So there's, there's a lot in the American tradition uh, of liberty, equality, all of these great inspiring values that young people will thrill to if you give them a chance to do it, instead of starting out with everything that's wrong with what we do. So I think you're saying the advice to parents, like Mike, is not so different from the advice you're giving to educators building a curriculum. Well, parents, yeah, parents and teachers. Parents are, are the first teachers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. get those, get those, yeah. get those books, um, and give them to yours. Okay, one last question, right here in the front row. Thank you, Nicholas. Hey, Nicholas, thank you for the great poster. Yeah. Hi, Stan Sienkiewicz. I'm probably your contemporary. How important uh, is the cultural context? I mean, I think back to the time you and I spent in grade school. Blue Collar Town in New Jersey. I, yeah. We pledged allegiance to the flag every morning. I did too, yep. And at some point along the way, you got a history class that taught you about you know, the revolution, yeah. the, the Puritans, the Civil War, and there was a context. I don't think that exists anymore, does it? Um, well, I, you know, I'm not an all or nothing person. I mean, I, 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 I clearly. We, we used to we used to toast we had, during our uh, recess or whatever it was when we drank milk we used to toast to Ike President Eisenhower. <laughs> <laughs> so so it was definitely a different context. So I, I, after you I, hid under the <laughs> desk during the yes, bomb scare, we did that too. We did that too. So yeah, I mean the world <laughs> the world's changed, but I you know you cannot give up on this. Uh, 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 um, there and there are pendulums and and people learn from mistakes and so on. So. Uh, sure, uh, but I wouldn't get too defeatist, uh, defeatist about that. And there, uh, I, c I can give you, there's still a lot of great examples all over the place. So you got to build on strengths. That's the principle of human development, too. I'm speaking not as a policy person or uh, as a developmentalist, a developmental psychologist. And I can tell you, the way people learn, the way things change, is you build on their strengths. You don't sit around feeling sorry for yourself. Uh, so I think that's what we have to do. Well, thank you very much. We're, I don't know that we have milk, but we're going to take a brief <laughs> recess uh, if, until uh, for just a few minutes, and then uh, Mike and uh, Robbie will be up here. Meanwhile, thank, thank you. you, Bill Damon. Thank you. Thank you very much.
I, I, exactly right. And you don't know, I mean. Okay, everybody come back on over. We're gonna get started again for the second half. Just a reminder while we're gathering again, uh, for those of you watching at home, you can follow along on Twitter at hashtag Ed2020. Uh, you can also send us questions online. I will be looking at my phone uh, to, to get those questions. So please do. And we're going to get started in just a moment. So everybody, come on over. Check her. Come on. Lead the crowd. No milk. Hey, well, again, my name is Mike Petrilli. I'm the president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute and a visiting fellow here at the Hoover Institution. Uh, and it is my great honor to introduce to you Professor Robert P. George. Uh, professor George is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions whew, at Princeton University. Uh, he is also frequently a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. Uh, he has served as chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. He has served on the President's Council on Bioethics. He's been a presidential appointment to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, the U.S. member of UNESCO's World Commission on Ethics of Science and Technology, author of numerous well-reviewed uh, books uh, and way too many articles to mention, uh, and recipient of some of the most prestigious awards uh, in this country, including the Presidential Citizens Medal, the Irving Crystal Award, and the Bradley Prize. Uh, I was honored, I got to, to hear you, Professor George, uh, when you were given the Irving Crystal Award at the AAI dinner a few years ago, and, and it was really an amazing uh, experience. Uh, Professor George is going to talk about the importance of having a uh, having intellectual diversity uh, on college campus. I'm, he's going to put that better than I just did. Uh, it'll be my job during the Q&A to bring it back down to the K-12 uh, system a little bit. Uh, but please join me in welcoming Professor George. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. It's really an honor and a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, and thanks, Checker, for the uh, – Checker, where are you? You have your milk yet yeah, to Eisenhower? Right. Uh, uh, thanks for the invitation. It's really great to be part of this larger uh, project that uh, Fordham and, and uh, Hoover have uh, going. Uh, I'm the world's biggest uh, Bill Damon fan, and when uh, when Bill talks, there's always something that jumps out at me. And and this time it was patriotism, and gosh, is that a virtue that we need to restore to its rightful place, really across the board, not just in uh, in education. Um, that really resonated with me. The two most important men in my life um, are my father and my father-in-law. Uh, both served with uh, great honor and valor. Uh, in the Second World War. They're 93 and 95, respectively, uh, now still going strong. Uh, my father, the son of a, an immigrant Syrian coal miner in the hills of southwestern Pennsylvania and West Virginia. Uh, my father-in-law, a Jewish guy from Brooklyn whose father was uh, Taylor. Um, both men had experienced a bit of prejudice and even discrimination. In my father's case, it was actually a a, a, Ku, a Ku Klux Klan incident uh, against his, uh, his family. But they fully understood the difference between the nation's fundamental principles and commitments, which were good and great, and what a few idiots did because they were bigoted. And when they were sent off to fight, they were proud to fight for their country. They were immigrant kids. They had, their parent fathers had just come over. But this was their country, and they were proud to fight for it. My father went down in the uh, Leopold Bill, the greatest naval loss of life in American uh, history, crossing the English Channel to fight in uh, northern France. But because he was one of the survivors and wasn't injured, he was picked up by the British, fished out of the Channel, and sent on to Normandy, where he fought in Brittany, uh, at Saint-Nazaire and uh, Lorient and was proud to do that. Uh, my father-in-law was captured at the Bulge, Jewish guy, captured at the Bulge. Spent the rest of the war, you know, those six months remaining in the war, uh, in German Stalags. Uh, but again, they were proud, and proud to win the victory on behalf of what the United States stood for. 
despite what they had themselves experienced as far as prejudice was concerned. And when it was over, they marched home. Same with the guys who fought in the terrible Pacific theater. They marched home, right? They didn't, they didn't take land. They didn't occupy. They marched home. And then we sent a bunch of dough over in the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe. I mean, if this is not a country we can be proud of, then I don't know how you would ever find such a country, despite our faults. So, you know, we, we, need to, we need to say that to each other. Even as adults, we need to remind each other. Yes, we do, can't whitewash our history, but we don't have to buy this Howard Zinn nonsense. This is a great country. Its principles are true and good, and we should fight for them and, and, and pass them on to our children. End of sermon. <laughs> Colleges and universities, uh, thank you. Colleges and universities that are dedicated to liberal arts ideals have three fundamental purposes. The pursuit, preservation, and transmission of knowledge. That's what these institutions are about. It's what they're for. Now, of course, there are other desirable ends that colleges and universities legitimately seek to achieve. But these are the fundamental and defining purposes of academic institutions, at least those that understand themselves to be liberal arts based. Other things that institutions undertake, whether it's in fine arts or professional training or athletics, are in a sense founded upon them, and anything they do that undermines these purposes, they should not be doing. If your athletic program, athletic programs are great, but if your athletic program is undermining your academic program, it's pretty, it should be pretty clear which needs to be reformed or go. A grave threat to the pursuit of these ideals of education, these defining purposes of education today, is posed by the politicization of the academy. The problem is most vividly manifest in uh, what I'll call uh, this afternoon the phenomenon of campus illiberalism. By that I mean the unwillingness of so many members of college and university communities, whether we're talking about students, faculty, or administration, to entertain or even to listen to arguments that challenge opinions that they happen to hold, whether those opinions have to do with climate science or racial and ethnic preferences, affirmative action, abortion, welfare policy, sexual morality, immigration, U.S. foreign policy, the international economic order, or the origins of human consciousness. At many institutions, speaking invitations are not even issued to dissenters from Catholic, uh, campus orthodoxies. If they are issued, dissenting speakers are disinvited under pressure from opponents of their views. Uh, the Buckley program at Yale uh, now has as a regular part of its activities the annual disinvitation dinner to feature people who've been disinvited from speaking engagements at other institutions. Or if they are not disinvited, they are pressured to withdraw under the threat of disruptive protest. You might remember that in the case of Condoleezza Rice. I believe it was at Rutgers. I hope I'm not defaming Rutgers. Uh, but at one of the major state universities a few years ago. Or if they do not withdraw, they are interrupted, shouted down, even subjected, as we've all seen, to violent assault. But it's not just outside speakers who are at risk. Faculty and student dissenters within campus communities are subjected to abuse and intimidation, as we've seen at Evergreen State, for example, and other places. Now, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush here. The situation is better or worse at different institutions. As it happens, the situation is not at all bad. In fact, it's quite good at my own institution. I've taught now for more than three decades at Princeton where, although I am a strong dissenter from just about everything uh, <laughs> uh, that's believed on campus, I've never been subjected to intimidation or abuse, although there have been threats against me from off campus, one of which landed the perpetrator in a federal prison, and threats have been made against Princeton for having me on its faculty. <laughs> Princeton, to its credit, has always stood up uh, to those. But everyone knows the cases I have it my, uh, in mind at colleges and universities around the country, whether you talk about Middlebury or Evergreen State or University of Missouri or Berkeley or what have you. Now, I spoke of this form of illiberalism as the most vividly manifest version of the problem I'm concerned. For what gets public attention are denials and withdrawals of speaking opportunities, the disruption of meetings, the shouted down of its dissenting speakers and the like. But these are merely some manifestations. The core problem is this. Many institutions are subverting the transmission of knowledge by failing to ensure that students at every level are confronted with and have the opportunity to consider and decide for themselves on the basis of the best that is to be said on the competing sides of all questions that are in dispute among reasonable people of goodwill. Instead, 
institutions permit prevailing opinions on campus to harden into dogmas. There's no other word for it. Dogmas that go largely unchallenged, leaving students with the entirely false belief that there are, in fact, no disputes on these matters among reasonable people of goodwill. All right-thinking people think left. At the problem's core is the toxic thing that provides the environment in which illiberalism flourishes. That toxic thing is groupthink. Now, liberal arts education goes beyond learning facts and acquiring skills, although those are very important. They're indispensable. You need to know, you know, that it was Grant who got Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse, not Eisenhower, and so forth. And you need to know the basic principles of logic. Something cannot both be and not be in the same respect at the same time, and so forth. But beyond that, it requires the engagement of the knowledge seeker, the student, with competing perspectives and points of view. Same is true for the scholar. It's a lifelong deal. It also requires certain virtues, including open-mindedness, respect for what John Stuart Mill called liberty of thought and discussion, intellectual humility, humility of the sort one can possess only insofar as one accepts one's own fallibility, and of course, love of truth. If you don't actually have the virtue of love of truth, you will have something different, and it's not a virtue, love of opinion. You'll fall in love with your own opinions so deeply you prefer them to the truth. You'd rather not know the truth if it's going to contradict your settled opinion around which you've so tightly integrated your emotions. You see a lot of that, and not just on college campuses these days. Now, it's the task of colleges and schools, this is K-12 as well, as institutions of learning to expose students to competing points of view and to foster in students those virtues. Open-mindedness, intellectual humility, love of truth, willingness to listen to the other person. And that's necessary not because there are no truths. This is not a plea or an appeal to moral or even more broadly general relativism. But rather because the pursuit of truth and the deeper appreciation or appropriation of truths in their meaning and significance requires it. Whatever's to be said about the predominance of certain views and their proponents on campuses and the exclusion of others, the problem I'm calling attention to here is less about unfairness to conservatives or others. It's the way it's often styled. Well, the, the situation at Yale, the situation at Princeton, the situation at Stanford or Oklahoma or Ohio State is unfair to conservatives. That may be true. That's not what I'm talking about here. That's not my concern here. Rather, it has to do with overcoming the groupthink that impedes institutions from pursuing their missions as institutions de designed to pursue truth, knowledge of truth, transmit knowledge of truth, preserve knowledge of truth. It's a scandal, scandal, when students graduate from liberal arts programs, and I don't care whether they're super prestigious ones like Middlebury uh, or less, less known colleges, wherever they're coming from, it's a scandal if they graduate with no understanding, or worse yet, with grotesque misunderstandings, of the arguments advanced by serious scholars and thinkers who dissent from fashionable orthodoxies on issues such as those I mentioned a moment ago. Even if the opinions that students have acquired, may have acquired in an environment of groupthink, happen to be true, their ignorance, the students' ignorance of the arguments of the dissenters, will prevent them from understanding the truth as deeply as they should and truly appropriating it. That is to say, understanding not just that thus and so is the case, but why it's so, why we should believe it to be so, and why competing views though false, have nevertheless attracted the attention and even the allegiance of some serious thinkers. The great 20th century jurist, Learned Hand, famously said, and I quote him, that the spirit of liberty is the spirit of being not too sure one is right. In making that point, Hand again was not endorsing radical skepticism or relativism or anything of the sort. Rather, he was pointing to the need for intellectual humility in light of the inescapable reality of human fallibility. But what he says about the spirit of liberty is also true of the spirit of truth seeking, the spirit that should be the spirit of education at any level. 
a sense of one's own fallibility, a sense that a lot of issues are hard. It's not obvious what the truth is. One can be wrong in one's opinions. An openness of mind, a willingness to entertain criticism and to engage critics and not suppose that they're bigots or idiots. All these things are essential to the truth-seeking project, the truth-seeking mission. And that means that they must be cultivated in institutions whose mission includes, centrally, the pursuit and transmission of knowledge. It's that simple. Now that is not to say that those of us who are academics, professional academics, professors, should not be advocates for our own views or not be engaged politically. I myself have always been highly engaged politically throughout my entire career in the academy. But politically engaged scholars and teachers, like all scholars and teachers, need to be highly cognizant of their own fallibility, even on matters about which they care deeply and causes in which they are profoundly emotionally invested. One must never imagine that one cannot possibly be wrong about this or that cherished conviction, or that one's political adversaries and intellectual critics cannot possibly be right. That is fatal to the truth-seeking enterprise. If you think there's no way you can be wrong, and there's no way that your critic can be right, it's over. You're now just doing dogma. You're not doing scholarship. You're not doing thought. I think the proper attitude for us to hold was taught to us, I'm like Bill, there's nothing original with me, was taught to us by Plato all the way back at the beginning of this business, by Plato, especially in the dialogue that comes down to us as the Gorgias. We must always be on the lookout, Plato teaches, for the true friend, the person who will confer upon us the inestimable benefit of showing us that we are in error where in fact we are in error. That is your best friend. Such a person in correcting our mistakes does us the very highest service. We need to see that and we need to help our students to see that. The guy who corrects you is not your enemy. He, he's your sort of intellectual adversary, but if he can show you the error in your thought, move you from a position of ignorance or error at least nearer to the truth, who ever had better friend than that? If the truth really is worth something as Plato teaches it is. One who sees his intellectual adversary as an enemy to be defeated rather than as a friend, join with him, dialectically, in the pursuit of a common aim, namely knowledge of the truth, is already off the rails. He's in grave danger of falling into the ditch of sophistry. A spirit of openness to argument and challenge where it flourishes in an academic culture is what immunizes academic institutions against groupthink and chases the group think away when it comes knocking at the door. Now part of the problem, of course, is that when one is in group think, when you're already in it, when it's taken hold, you don't recognize the problem. It's like the fish who doesn't realize he's swimming in water. When is the last time you met somebody who said, yeah, you know what my problem is, is really I'm caught up in group think. <laughs> I tend to think just like everybody around me. The tr that <laughs> I did have the experience once of someone telling me, that wonderful scholar, one of the best scholars at my university, uh, the, the person who uh, specialized in a, uh, a certain tradition of, uh, of, of literature and she was wh where, where, where she was really a master, uh, but she was talking about her general political views and she just said to me, you know, she said, you know, I've just sort of picked up my political views just by, from, you know, all the people around me. I haven't really thought about them all that much. Um, you may realize, of course, if you're in group think, you may realize that not everyone shares your views, but you'll suppose that those who dissent from them are either irrational or ill-motivated. You will imagine that anyone who disagrees with you is either a bigot or a tool of nefarious interests, a fool or a fraud. When someone is in group think, he or she could pass a lie detector test. Here's the scary thing claiming that he or she is not in groupthink. But that doesn't mean that he or she is not in groupthink. And wherever ideological orthodoxies settle into place, we have to worry about the groupthink setting in. That's true whether or not campus illiberalism visibly manifests itself in dissenting speakers being excluded from campus and people being shouted down and all that other stuff. Now, viewpoint diversity has value 
as a kind of vaccine against groupthink and as an antidote to groupthink when it begins to set in. Diversity of views, approaches, arguments, and the like is the cure for campus illiberalism. It means having people with different views around and also even in a classroom, even on a syllabus, making sure students are reading Marx and Hayek, Mill and Stephen, people who are serious and thoughtful but who disagree about stuff. People who have the spirit of being not too sure they're right, people who want to be challenged because they know that challenging and being challenged are integral and indispensable to the process of knowledge seeking, such people, whatever their own personal views, will want viewpoint diversity on campus in order for their institution to accomplish its mission. You don't have to be a conservative to believe in viewpoint diversity and its value. You can be a liberal. You can be a progressive. There are such people. We all know that it's hard, though, to get this kind of intellectual or viewpoint diversity in contemporary American higher education. And I think there are several reasons for that, reasons that go well beyond the deliberate discrimination in hiring pr and promotion against people who dissent from regnant orthodoxies that we hear about so often. In fact, I don't think such blatant you know, open discrimination, uh, though regrettable uh, in the fact that it does occur, is the heart of the problem. I don't think that's really the core of it. The more fundamental and difficult challenge is that we human beings, frail and fallen creatures that we are, have trouble appreciating meritorious work and even good arguments when they run contrary to our own opinions, especially when we're strongly emotionally attached to those opinions. We human beings really do tend to wrap our emotions very tightly around our convictions, which is good that people believe in stuff. We should believe in stuff. It's, it's, it's the fact that we're emotionally committed to our views that enables us to get off, you know, the, out of the chair and do our work, you know, whether you're the doctor delivering babies or, or you're uh, the school teacher teaching the kids or you're the social activist or whatever ever you are. The trouble is, of course, when it gets too tight, when our emotions are too tightly wound around our convictions, dogmatism sets in. Now, as I see it, this is not in principle, intrinsically, a progressive or left-wing problem. I have a debate with some of my conservative friends about this. They think it's a progressivism problem. I don't think it's a progressivism problem. I think it's a human nature problem. Any time an intellectual or political orthodoxy has hardened into place, doesn't matter whether it's right-wing or left-wing. It becomes very difficult for many people to draw the distinction between, one, work I disagree with, despite its being really very good and challenging and interesting and important, and two, work that goes contrary to what I just know to be true on issues that are very important to me and bound up with my senses of who I am as a fill-in-the-blank. Progressive, conservative, feminist, libertarian, Christian, atheist, whatever. People will perceive, and here we, we see this all over the place now in higher education, people will perceive challenges to the dominant opinions as outrageous attacks on truth, indecent assaults on essential values, threats to what is good and true and right and just, intolerable violations of the norms of our community. You remember those students at Yale confronting Nicholas Christakis? What was their complaint? His wife's email was an assault on our community's values. Like, we're the community. Mrs. Christakis, she's not the community. This is our place. Who are you people? You're not with the program? Out of here. So what do we do? First, I address my friends in academia who are on the progressive side of the political divide and who perceive the problem as I do. As I say, there's some who do and who think something should be done about it. Well, number one, we do need to expose and protest any overt conscious discrimination based on viewpoint. As I say, it does happen. I don't think it's a problem, but it does happen, and it's bad. You need to call it out the minute you see it, period. By both precept and example, we also need to strongly encourage our colleagues and students to be rigorously self-critical in ways that would enable them honestly to say, as I might say about the work of, for example, my colleague at Princeton, Peter Singer, well, you know, I'm really scandalized by Peter's defense of the moral permissibility of infanticide. But there's an argument that's got to be met. 
And the burden is on me to make the argument that our dignity as human beings comes by virtue of our humanity, our status as members of the human community. The burden is on me to meet his challenge by establishing that there is a special kind of standing and inviolability that we have in virtue of the kinds of creatures we are as human beings. And if you look at a lot of my work in the bioethics area, I've worked with Yuval on this. We've even written together on it. Uh, Yuval Levin, who's here. You'll see that it's really an attempt to, to try to show rigorously the foundations for our belief in the inviolability of the human person, the dignity of the human person, what it is that's special about human beings as such. And I want my progressive colleagues to take the same position that I take toward Professor Singer, toward work by more conservative scholars, especially in those hot button areas. But I acknowledge that this is hard to do, especially when dogmas and orthodoxies have hardened into place, and one is not even hearing arguments against one's own position. I mean, look, if you go through life, you're on a university campus, you live in a university community, you're in Ann Arbor, Princeton, New Jersey, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Berkeley, California, Athens, you're one of these places, and you never meet anybody who thinks differently than you do. Well, naturally, it's going to be pretty hard to think your way out of it. You need those challenges. We're mere humans. We need to be challenged if we're really going to think. When one is not hearing them, and everybody one knows tends to think the same thing about the great issues of the day, no matter how much diversity there is on other matters, we're likely headed for groupthink. Now, working up the motivation to think more critically gets much easier when, in the normal course of things, one is regularly challenged by thoughtful people who do not always see things just as one does oneself. So it's best for us not to get into the group think in the first place. Now, a growing number of prominent university leaders around the country, and I'm going to name names, Robert Zimmer, president of the University of Chicago, Michael Roth, president of Wesleyan University, Christopher Eisgruber, president of my place, Princeton University, Carol Crist, Chancellor of uh, University of California, Berkeley, Ronald Daniels, President of Johns Hopkins, among others, most of whom, by the way, are self-identified progressives, are publicly acknowledging, and this, it's about time this happened, but they're doing it, God bless them, publicly acknowledging the groupthink or echo chamber problem in American higher education and are asking for help in doing something about it. You know, you're never gonna deal with a problem until you, you acknowledge you got a problem, whether it's alcoholism or some other kind of addiction or whatever it is, until you say, you know what, dad's drinking. Nobody's going to deal with dad's alcoholism. You got to acknowledge the problem, not pretend it doesn't exist. And we've got some academic leaders now in higher ed who are acknowledging the problem. Now here, alumni and friends of American higher education who want to make a difference have a golden opportunity. They can join efforts to found or support campus initiatives aimed at bringing wide, a wider diversity of views into the discussion and turning campus monologues into true dialogues. Centers and institutes have already been created at many top universities in the US and Britain to, ju to do just that, and they're already having an impact. Allow me to give you a couple examples of the value of intellectual diversity drawn just from my own personal experience. One is the James Madison program uh, at Princeton, which I founded and have the honor to direct. Uh, it was founded in 2000, so I guess 19 years ago, and its impact on the intellectual culture of Princeton, precisely by bringing viewpoint diversity into our community in a serious way, has been truly remarkable. It gives me enormous satisfaction that this opinion is shared not just by the handful of conservatives on campus, but by a great many of my liberal colleagues who share none of my other opinions. They praise the Madison program for turning what might have been monologues into true dialogues, or multilogues or what have you, and benefiting everybody in the process. The presence on campus of such an initiative uh, means that there are people around who think different things. And that means general discussions across the university and not just in our little center. This is the key thing. Not just in our center. In discussions in the history department or sociology department or over in engineering or at any place, people cannot simply suppose that everybody in the room shares the same assumptions or holds the same opinions. Therefore, people know that they have to defend their premises because otherwise those premises are going to be challenged. That makes for a different and much better and much more serious kind of engagement, which profoundly enriches the intellectual life of the entire community. A second example, again from my own experience, 
has been teaching together with my friend and colleague Cornell West. Now understand that Professor West and I have some deep disagreements. He's a democratic socialist, I'm a traditional conservative. But what happens in our joint seminars is magical. And the impact on our students is amazing. We collaborate across the lines of ideological and political difference in the common project of truth seeking, knowledge seeking, wisdom seeking. Engaging with each other and our students in a serious, respectful manner, striving to understand and learn from each other, treating each other not as enemies, but as partners in that dialectical process of seeking truth and knowledge and wisdom. Not merely hearing each other or tolerating each other's speaking, but actually listening to each other and engaging each other, and trying to figure out whether there might be something true in what that guy's saying or trying seriously to engage the problem, even if you think what he's saying is wrong. Say why it's wrong. And here's the thing that really matters. The students learn. And they learn how to learn. They learn to approach intellectual and political matters dialectically, critically engaging the most compelling points to be adduced in favor of the competing ideas and claims. They learn the value and importance of mutual respect and civility, which are valuable in themselves, but they learn that they're valuable not only in themselves, but also because they make the truth-seeking project possible. They learn from two guys with some pretty strong opinions, ne neither of whom is shy about stating them publicly, that the spirit of truth-seeking, like the spirit of liberty, is indeed open to the possibility that one is in error, even in one's fundamental outlook. Cornell and I both can't be, one, at least one of us has got to be wrong. Now what Cornell and I do, I believe, is part of the cure for campus illiberalism. Now I've always prided myself as a teacher on being able to represent accurately and sympathetically moral and political views I don't myself share. So if I'm teaching about any of the hot button issues uh, that I've uh, mentioned, um, I like to think that if someone came into my classroom who happened not to know which side I was on, they wouldn't be able to figure out from my presentation of the competing positions and arguments for them and against them, uh, for and against this proposition or that proposition, they wouldn't be able to figure out where I myself stand. Now, that's not because I think professors should hide their views. Outside of the classroom, I don't do that. And because my views are fairly public, there's not a single student in my class who's in any doubt about where I stand on any issue I teach about. And yet, I pride myself on making sure that if somebody from, if Cornell were sitting in the classroom, I may be lecturing or, or not doing one of our seminars, but if he walked in and he heard me presenting his position, he wouldn't think, I'm just setting up a straw man. I'm just giving a caricature of his position. Um, I don't think classrooms should be used to proselytize or push a moral or political agenda or recruit adherence for one's causes. That's why no matter how much I care about an issue, I really do strive to present the very best arguments, not only for my own positions, but for positions I strongly reject. I mean, I, I sometimes teach uh, Marx, I teach Gramsci, uh, I, I teach, Mar teach Marcuse. It's hard for me to think of somebody whose views I abhor more than Marcuse's uh, views. And yet, I try to teach them in a way that Marcuse himself, if he walked into the room, would have to admit was a fair presentation of his view. Because if the kids are going to reject his argument, they might accept, they might reject, they're going to reject it. I want them to reject his actual argument, not some straw man caricature of it. But having said everything I just said, guess what, folks? What I've learned in teaching with Cornell is that as good as I think I am on this, presenting the other side faithfully, well, I'm not good enough. The evidence is simply that time after time in the course of our seminars together, I've found Cornell saying something or making a compelling point in response to a point that I or one of the more conservative students have made that simply would not have occurred to me, a point that needs to be seriously considered and engaged. Had Cornell not been there, even doing my best to represent his side, the progressive side, the point would not have been made and the benefit to be conferred on all of us in grappling with it would not have been gained. And guess what? Cornell tells me that he has had precisely the same experience time and again. He's found me making points or developing lines of argument that he says he had never considered and that simply would not have occurred to him even though he shares my aspiration, which he really honestly does, if you ever see him in a classroom, 
uh, to represent as fully and sympathetically as possible conservative positions or other positions that he doesn't hold. Now, a healthy intellectual milieu is one in which students and scholars regularly encounter competing views and arguments, where intelligent dissent from dominant views is common, and the value of dissent is understood and appreciated. It's what I like and what I'm hearing from Zimmer and Eisgruber uh, and Roth and Daniel and the others, where beliefs that can be supported by arguments and advance in the spirit of goodwill are common enough that they do not strike people as reflections of ignorance or bigotry or bad will, and people who do not share them, uh, as, uh, uh, do not experience them as personal assaults or outrages against the community. Uh, let me close with a plea to teachers and administrators and school board members and parents and anyone else who's able to influence what goes on in K-12 and especially high school education. You are sending those of us who teach at the college level increasingly diverse students, and that's great. It's especially wonderful to see so many young men and women at places like Princeton, and lots of other places, who are of the first generation in their families to go to college. I, I'm that myself, and, and I really think it's wonderful to see it and see so much of it. It's also great to see so many children of immigrants in my classes, immigrants from nations spanning the entire globe. Bravo. That's what we want. But I'm also seeing something else. And it's not what we want or should want. Students who are diverse in myriad ways and yet alike in their viewpoints and perspectives and prejudices. Students who have absorbed what I sometimes the New York Times view of the world. They think what, evidently, they think they are supposed to think. They seem to have absorbed uncritically progressive ideology, and they embrace it zealously, obediently, and alas, dogmatically as a faith, as a kind of religion. Challenging its presuppositions and tenets is regarded not merely as wrong or even heretical, but as in many uh, cases, and as in many cases, quite literally, unthinkable. I just can't, couldn't possibly conceivably think that. Challenging its presuppositions and tenets is regarded not merely as wrong or even heretical, but unthinkable. In other words, they come to us, these students, very diverse in so many ways, and yet already in groupthink. I suppose that makes the job of those left-wing professors who actually do want to indoctrinate their students easy. They come pre-indoctrinated. Now, this is bad. Sure, it makes it fun like, for people like me to shock and scandalize these kids, to awaken them from their dogmatic slumbers in the way I suppose it was fun for secular liberal professors of an earlier era to shock and scandalize students from devout evangelical backgrounds by teaching Darwinian evolution or teaching them uh, the historical critical approach to understanding the Bible. These days, I'm, I'm feeling a little kind of a kinship with those professors from the from the, from the 1950s, because suddenly I'm occupying their role. I'm the, I'm the guy who is, uh, again, awakening, awakening them from their dogmatic slumbers. But that's scarcely comforting. The purpose of um, uh, higher education is not to enable me to entertain myself. If teachers or schools are doing the indoctrination, they really must stop. And even if they aren't, Schools need to teach students to question dominant or prevailing opinions among their peers and in their communities and equip them with the tools of critical thinking and logical reasoning that will make such questioning intellectually fruitful for them. For starters, kids need to be taught that whatever they and their peers believe and take as what all right-thinking people believe is actually contested by fellow citizens of theirs who are no less reasonable people of goodwill than they themselves are. My experience with students in recent years tends to support the thesis that many are ignorant of this fact. I'm just inclined to think that if somebody doesn't go along with the New York Times editorial policy on this, that, or the other thing, they really are rubes or bigots or fools or the, the tools of nefarious capitalist interests or what have you. Sure, they know there are people who don't share 
the editorial board of the New York Times opinion or the opinion of people on the stage at the Academy Awards, you know, Katy Perry or Lady Gaga or whatever, but they really think those people are either bigots or ignoramuses. And by saying that students, as I said, need to be taught that there are reasonable people who don't share their outlook, I mean they need to be taught by example as well as by precept. Teachers in schools need to model the tolerance, open-mindedness, willingness to challenge and be challenged, and other values that we need to see more of in our students at all levels and in our citizens. Young men and women in, say, New York public or private schools or in San Francisco or Chicago should not have to wait for college to encounter libertarian or neoconservative or socially conservative arguments, authors, guest speakers, or for that matter, teachers. I have a sense that there are many schools in which conservative teachers are as rare and, if they exist at all, exotic as they are in universities. Whatever the reason or the, whatever accounts for this state of affairs, it is not good. A final word for schools and teachers. Especially in the domains of civic and moral education, students need to be equipped with a fund of basic knowledge, including notably knowledge of American and world history, and with the skills to think deeply and critically and for themselves. Thinking for yourself should be a big, it should be, a, it should be like this. What is this thing you were talking about, Checker? ESL or whatever it is? That, what's the latest fad? OK, I want a new fad. The new fad is independent thinking. The, the slogan is, think for yourself. It'll be a radical idea. Think for yourself. If schools are doing their jobs properly, they will be sending us at the universities students who can spot bias in any direction in, say, history textbooks, and even if the bias is in a direction they themselves favor. Our job then, at the university level, will be to help them deepen their knowledge and further refine their critical thinking skills. Kids will come to us from high school already on their way to being independent thinkers, lifelong learners, and their own best Critics. This is when I know I've succeeded. Not, it's not just when they are learning, or even when they are, I can tell, going to be lifelong learners. We've now got them in the mode where they're going to be lifelong learners. I need one more thing to say bingo, and that is I see that they are now their own best critics. They don't have to wait for me to challenge them on even deeply held views that they have. If I say, Henry, you, uh, you believe in, uh, you believe in uh, that, that, that uh, climate change. Uh, you, you, you hold the standard progressive view on, on climate change. Um, why are there some people like Freeman Dyson and Will Happer and people like that who, who, who aren't buying it? What, you know, you, you, you are and you think they're wrong. Uh, if they were here, what would they say to you? And if they can tell me how they would criticize themselves, perhaps drawing on the resources of people like the ones I've, I've mentioned, then I know we're there. We've mission accomplished. We've made them their own best critics. And that means they will also be on their way, as Bill noted, to being responsible citizens, fit to enjoy, and equipped to play their role in sustaining and passing along to future generations the rich blessings of living in a democratic republic. Thank you. Wow. Uh, anybody else jealous of those students that get to be in <laughs> Professor George's classes or in the class with <laughs> Cornell West? And you, wow. Uh, let me just ask a few questions, and then I'll let others get in on this. Uh, I, I have a hard time thinking that most fair-minded people would listen to that and, and think, OK. You're making a very strong argument for viewpoint diversity uh, and for engaging each other in this way. Yet, here we are in Washington, uh, a city where these kinds of debates uh, don't seem to be happening uh, lately, that there's not a respectful disagreement uh, where we are listening uh, earnestly and honestly to people's views who, uh, who are different than our own. Uh, yeah. So wh what do you say to people who say, well, this all sounds very nice within the ivy walls of the academy and the search for truth, but in the real world, of the, in the democracy that we live in, that we're preparing students to be a part of, you know, it's completely different. 
uh, you know, we're living in the jungle, you know, and, and you're living in Princeton, but those are two different places. Well, first I'd say you're right, and that's really scary uh, because the same core virtues that you need to sustain the mission of a liberal arts institution, you need to sustain a pluralistic democratic republic. Uh, Cornell and I have done some writing together now. And uh, let me commend to you, you can easily look it up, a statement that we uh, put out, I guess a couple of years ago now, called Truth Seeking Democracy and uh, Freedom of Thought and Expression. Um, it's now been, so we put it on the internet and invited people to sign, it's been signed by 50, uh, I'm sorry, 5,000 people, mostly, mostly academics and uh, students, although the signature I'm proudest of is the signature of a, of a uh, janitor who works for a university in uh, Ohio, and he sent a note along, a wonderful, beautiful note, saying that while he was a janitor and was not involved in, uh, in, in teaching, uh, you know, he felt uh, an allegiance to the institution that he served and to, the, to its mission to teach students, and he, he thought that what we said was absolutely right, and he wanted to associate himself uh, with that. Uh, and that was really quite beautiful. But the core, the, the reason we, we, we combine those two things, truth-seeking and democracy, truth-seeking democracy and freedom of thought and expression was precisely because you need these same values. The fact that it's a jungle down here and out, out there uh, is evidence that we're in some serious trouble. Um, the response to the kinds of things I just said to you from people who are not buying it is, Look, at the end of the day, it's just about power. It's just about power. There's no, no, really no such thing as truth seeking. It's just about power and who has it and who gets to keep it and who gets to exercise it over other people. And this is just a rhetorical mask for trying to grab power or hold power or hold power in the hands of the people who have power. Now, free speech is a weapon that uh, is used against uh, the, the people who are held in uh, circumstances of oppression and so forth. Now, you know, my considered opinion of that is that it's idiotic, but there are significant now sectors of society in which something like that is believed. And Cornell, uh, to his very great credit, uh, is vigorous in responding to people who make the argument against free speech and viewpoint diversity on campus by saying it's all about power and this is just a mask for the powerful to to continue their uh, oppression. He makes the point that you know, free speech has always been essential to uh, the prosecution of the cause of justice, whether we're talking about uh, uh, Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela or whoever you, 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 think, you think it is. I mean, pe people on the left have to remember that, that you, know, you either have free speech or don't. The Marcuse's idea that you can have it for the oppressed but not for the, the alleged oppressor is just not a feasible uh, idea. So, you know, if you, if you want justice, you should be behind free speech. And if you want to sustain democracy, you need it as well. And so part of why we want to do what I'm saying we should do in schools, at least why I want to do what we should do in schools and universities, is to form citizens who will bring those values to the democratic form. So into the debate walks President Donald Trump. Uh, signed an executive order last week. Uh, requiring universities uh, and colleges to make sure, I'm going to again butcher the language here, but to make sure that, that there is free speech on campus or else uh, risk losing federal research funds. It's been interesting to watch a lot of uh, different reactions across the spectrum, inclu including on the Republican side, the Libertarian side. Uh, many of our colleagues not thrilled about this particular executive order. Uh, Lamar Alexander, uh, not thrilled about it. Could be curious what you think, if, uh, if this is going to help her. Yeah, I'll, I'll say th three things about it. Um, uh, first, I completely understand the impulse. I completely understand the reason for the order. Um, my uh, understanding of the order is it doesn't fundamentally change what obligations universities uh, have, uh, with those that are receiving federal funds or those who are state institutions. Certainly their constitutional obligations don't need a, an executive order from Donald Trump or Barack Obama or anybody else mm -hmm. in order to, to, to be their obligations. Um, but all the bad stuff that you see, uh, and a lot that you don't even hear about. Mm -hmm. you know, it, Middlebury makes it into the news, Evergreen State makes it into the news, Berkeley and Missouri do, but there, you know, there's lots of stuff that goes on that, that you just don't, you don't read about. And that's the impulse. 
to do something about it. Uh, and in America, when people want to do something about it, they look to Washington. And this is my second point. I'm a conservative. I don't like looking to Washington for everything. And it makes me nervous when Washington wants to get involved in stuff. And it makes me nervous when, when government in general, and certainly when Washington gets involved with the management of higher education. So my plea to my fellow academics is we had better clean up our own house here or something that I don't approve of any more than you approve of is going to happen, and that is that Washington, D.C., the government, federal government, the national government, is going to get in here and start dictating educational policy. That will not be good for, uh, for higher education. But the only reason we're getting what we got the other day from President Trump, this is, this is not some initiative Trump cooked up or the Trumpians cooked up. They're responding to a reality that we had better acknowledge, and that is we do have a serious problem. The, the third point is that I think there's some good analysis that's favorable. The case is made more strongly than I would have thought it could be made in favor of the Trump order by um, Stanley Kurtz mm -hmm. uh, and by Roger Kimball, both of whom have pieces out. I forget where. You can easily find them online. I forget where they appeared. I think Stanley's might have been in National Review. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, acknowledging both Roger and Stanley, Stanley in particular, as I recall, fully acknowledges the concerns that I have. He has them too, mm -hmm. uh, but he's less worried about the order. He sees it as, as more limited, more likely to do uh, uh, good than I have. I think if it does do good, it will, it will do good by motivating us to start cleaning up our, our, uh, our own house, which uh, you know, we should do without it, but if this is what it takes, then this is what it takes. But remember, one last point. I guess this is number four. The free speech problem is in part, in significant part, the result of the lack of viewpoint diversity. Mm -hmm. You can enforce the free speech stuff, but unless you get to the viewpoint diversity part of the problem, you're not really going to solve it. And I'm quite sure that we don't want Washington, D.C. dictating viewpoint diversity. So I hope that university leaders around the country will follow the example of the, pe the, the leaders I mentioned, like Zimmer and Eisgruber and, uh, and Daniel and, and, and Roth, uh, and that they themselves, those leaders themselves, will follow through and make good on uh, what they uh, rightly say needs to happen to diversify the faculty. Uh, you're not going to get people experiencing dissenting views as vicious assaults on our values or even personal attacks on, on, our, on me. Uh, if they regularly hear uh, voices like Harvey Mansfield's at, at Harvard, if those are not exotic, but just part of the normal warp and woof of, uh, of academic right. life. And not somebody that has to come in uh, to give a, a lecture one time. And then exactly yeah. right. You, you right. can't, I mean, if that's all you can get, I'll take it. Yeah. I'll take whatever I can get, but that's not going to solve the problem. If you, if you want a healthy academic environment, you're going to need viewpoint diversity. And there's a reason that we don't have it, and it's a bad reason. You know, that you sometimes people, some, I mean, nobody can deny the, the, the data, right? So you know that the sociology department is 43 progressives and one conservative is not really conservative, he's libertarian. Everybody knows about, uh, about these. But sometimes you'll hear people with daffy ideas. Oh, well, the reason for that is that uh, conservatives are dumb and liberals are smart. Or, uh, well, of course, conservatives are as smart as liberals, but conservatives like to make money, and liberals like, you know, learning, and so the liberals go to Wall Street, the conservatives go to Wall Street, and the liberals, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you hear crazy stuff like that. Right. But none of that ac accounts for it. I mean, I think the way you account for it is the way that I accounted for we it. We really only have time for one question, so who is it going to be? All right, you were Adam. first. You were quick. Tell us who you are. Hi, Adam Kissel, currently at Philanthropy Roundtable. My question is about admissions offices at colleges. If it's so important, and I agree it is, to have intellectual diversity and a place like Princeton especially has its pick, what's the role of admissions offices on the psychological side of getting people who can actually handle disagreement, but also getting a diversity of ideas in, on, in that area of diversity? My pre again, the president of Princeton, Chris Eisgruber, has been very good uh, about this. One of the lessons that I believe he, he must have taken away from uh, 2016 is we need a broader representation of our student body of people from the, from the heartland, of uh, uh, people who, whose parents maybe voted for Donald Trump, uh, who themselves may you know, be MAGA hat uh, uh, wearers. Um, I, I think that's right. I mean, we need a more diverse 
uh, student body. And, and that doesn't mean, you know, having a progressive from New York and having a progressive from Wisconsin and having a progressive from Arizona and having, finding the progressive in Utah and, 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 and so forth. It means real diversity of, of, uh, of, of viewpoint. I think that's important. Uh, the, other, the other thing is it would help, again, if, if the high schools and the families would send us students who don't get the vapors when they hear somebody doubt the New York Times view of the world, some feature of the New York Times view uh, of the world. You know, we, we need them to, to come to us already prepared to, to hear. I mean, as things stand, they really are, in so many cases, the equivalent of the kid, the evangelical kid from Iowa in 1954 who's sent to Yale where they, he's shocked because the professor says that his great, 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 great grandmother was a monk. That we, I mean, our, our, kids are, our kids are insulted if you say this, right? But that's the condition that we've got ourselves into. It's not their fault. It's what they were brought up with. Like the kid in Iowa, who's shocked by historical criticism of the Bible in 1958. Please join me in thanking Professor George for great Thank comments. You. Wish we had more time. Uh, Wow, that was great. And thanks again, Bill, Damon. Uh, we will be back again next month with two more. I think we are rounding the, the uh, well, the finish line is in sight. I think we've got something like three more sessions to go. Uh, so we'll be in touch about that. Please join uh, us over here for the reception, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.